Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 218 for Monday, July 8th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that is by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California is Paul Kent. And today we have a sponsor, Band Zoogle has returned to the show. Our promo Excellent. code Gig Gab gets you 15% off your first year. We'll tell you more details about why you're going to go to bandzoogle.com shortly here. But, uh, you know, I want to start. Kevin sent in a note. We love gear. And we love talking about how uh, sheet music is a mess on stage and how uh, some people hate the look of iPads on stage. Although I think we've we've sort of I, I certainly think that there's a way to make that work. Uh, laptops look terrible on stage. It's too much. Uh, but. Kevin sends us a thing that really surprised me. It's called the lyrics prompter. I've seen people build these things uh, for themselves. This is one of the first ones that I've seen truly for sale. It's actually a one man shop. It sounds like in San Diego and he's taken a monitor wedge sized and shaped case and put a screen and a laptop inside it with a, a series of, of USB ports on the side. Uh, it's a 24 inch monitor. So big, nice big screen and uh and he's put, uh, like I said, he put a laptop inside, USB ports on the side, and a three-pedal setup that plugs right into one of those USB ports. So you're not worried about, like, wireless stuff or whatever. And you can sort of configure it any way you like. And it looks uh, it looks fantastic. It it's You could probably build one for less than the 800 bucks that he would charge you to do this. But I doubt that your first one would be built anywhere near the smoothness and quality yeah yeah exactly it's rugged yeah and you it's can a monitor i mean it's it's in like a road road ready case and yep. you know it's, it yep. looks like a monitor it looks like a monitor wedge that's exactly right yeah yeah so 800 bucks you can add 50 bucks lets you add um uh plexiglass over it and another 50 bucks it comes with a protective cover so uh so did you look into this very much I, I've looked into these over time. I, personally, I don't like this would be the worst thing for me because I'm a drummer. Right. Mm. So it, like, it would it would be better for way better suited for you standing up at the front of the stage than it would be for me. I mean, I would I could use it for like acoustic gigs or whatever, where I'm wearing my pitch slap and and that sort of thing would make sense. But uh, behind the kit, it would actually require me to look out of my line of sight in order to see a monitor wedge that's, you know, on the floor or something. So. Uh, but so it, it has Wi-Fi. It does. Yeah. It, it's got 32 gig of storage. Yep. Got a quiet fan. It's got Bluetooth. Um, I wonder what the mechanism, if you want, uh, someone makes a, a request and you want to have, you know, a roadie or something, bring up the, bring yeah. up the lyrics on the fly. If there's a way to do that. There is. So it, um, the, the foot pedal that it comes with is a USB thing so that you're never worried about like batteries or, you know, Bluetooth getting in the way, but it does have Bluetooth and it comes with a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse or Bluetooth keyboard and trackpad that, that he sells with it all in one. And, uh, and so you definitely could use that to, you know, to pull up whatever you needed to pull up on, uh, on the thing and, and do that very efficiently, which is pretty good. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see it now. There's a cool video demo of the whole thing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he looks like it looks like really quality build too. It does. It yeah. He's. I mean, he clearly built this for himself and then sort of iterated on it and and really, you know, he had other people asking him, "Hey, I want that." So yeah, 
pretty good. I love the, the about us is hysterical. My name is uh, Guillermo Mogams, and I have been the lead singer in rock cover bands from Boston to San Diego since 2014. Every gig, I perform nearly 50 songs, and I started growing frustrated with iPad stands and those awful lyric sheets. After some research, I found that the prompters on the market for musicians are way too expensive, especially for hobby musicians. What's more, they're just too big and clunky and difficult to carry around. That's when I decided I could build a better lyrics prompter myself. And it really looks like he has. It, it does. Yeah. Hey. It's, really, it's really nicely built. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. So uh, we'll, we'll see if we can learn some more about it and, and talk about it here uh, on the show as we as we dig in a little cool bit more. Cool share, Kevin. Thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah, indeed. Um, speaking of gear, I wanted to circle back very quickly to show 217 where we were talking about uh, monitors and how I run mine where I, I don't use wireless. And I mentioned that I use a headphone amp in line. Uh, what I did not mention was which one I use. <laughs> and several of you asked me about that. So sorry about that. I use a Rolls PM50S. It PM is, stands for personal monitor and it's their little personal monitor amp. The cool part about this one from Rolls is it has two inputs. One's a quarter inch input. So you take that from the board and I always carry a quarter inch to XLR adapter for both directions, for both female or male XLR that way, if the if the you know the the uh, board wants to if the house engineer wants to send me an XLR, I'm not saying hey, could you have a converter? I always keep one of those with me. Um, and then it also has an XLR pass through on it that has that can be controlled with a different volume knob. So most of the time now, I don't have to use that because the house engineer will give me you know Wi-Fi access to the mixer and just let me mix my ears entirely by myself. But back in the old days, before I could do that, getting your ear mix is is essential, right? It like if an engineer has a, a Wi-Fi board and won't give you access to the board, that's a huge red flag to me that they don't understand what's going on. Because if they don't give you Wi-Fi access to the board, it means that you and the engineer are going to spend countless moments, if not, you know, many, many minutes going back and forth about getting that mix just right. Whereas if they give you access to the board, that headache is gone from both of you. So, um, but this, this pass through is built to put your, say your vocal mic into and, uh, and then you can add more of your vocal mic to your ears without it affecting the pass through back to the board. So that can be a, a handy quick thing on stage. Like I'm not hearing enough of my vocals. So you just reach down and turn it up and you're good to go. So that's the Rolls PM 50 S it's like 50 bucks. So, um, so that's, that was, that was that easy fix. It was, it's an easy fix. Yep. Sorry about missing that last time. I did put it in the show notes after the show. Cause I knew, but it's not enough. It's not enough. Speaking of speaking of show notes, you know, we do at giggabpodcast.com. Not only do we have the episode audio posted, but we list by chapter, actually, every subject that we talked about. And you can click on those chapters and jump right to that segment of the show. And if you're listening on a podcatcher, say, you know, some app on your phone or, or whatever that supports chapters, most of them do. You can actually see the chapters right there in your app. So go ahead and check that out because we've been doing that uh, I think basically since day one, but certainly, uh, you know, for the last several years, we've been doing it here. So but to be clear, this is not available to f people who find us on Facebook, right? You, we don't list the chapter links on Facebook. Um, well, we certainly we list all of the chapters. Well, we yeah. list them, but but it's not linkable from a Facebook post into a certain chapter. Of no, the you can't. Right. You can. Yeah. Yeah. The only place that you can do that is. Well, you can't listen on Facebook anyway. You have to click through to the website from there. There's no we don't we don't publish our show as listenable on Facebook. We just publish a link to the um, to the episode right. page. So, yeah. 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 So. So I, I just mentioned that because I've had people say, wow, I discovered do you do chapters. It's like, oh, right. We should let you well, know. We should. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. You played some gigs, my friend. Oh, man, we're really in the thick of our of our busy time. So I had four in a row Thursday through Sunday this past week. Today's Monday. And this coming week, I have five in a row Wednesday through Sunday. And, uh, you know, I am I am caught with a bunch of emotions when we do these things because some of them are hard gigs. Some of them are hard work. Sure. Some of them are hard performances. Some of them are less than ideal settings. 
I just wanted to share the most interesting lesson from this past weeks of four gigs. Now remember the band we've done four in a row. We've done much more than four in a row. Um, but this week was kind of interesting. So we, again, we start with all hail to bill. Everybody should have a bill. Bill gets there early. Usually by the time we show up, our stage is set. Beautiful. We load our own selves in. Right. Right. And, and we go. It is an amazing gift that we don't have to slog through a lot of that stuff. Right. Yep. And so um, that's one thing. But again, it's just it's work. I mean, the, the performing time is is joyous, but but it's just work. And the first reflection we have, I want to jump to the fourth of the four gigs because we played uh, Thursday night, you know, a good energetics gig. Friday, I did a solo acoustic. Saturday, we did a long uh, ticketed gig, which I want to share a few things about. And it was the first time we had like this intense uh, run this year, this much. And uh, so Sunday, we had a one o'clock gig after ending at about 1015 the night before. So we had a, a mid afternoon gig. And I knew that the guys were, you know, we put a lot out the night before. I certainly was feeling it physically. And I, we've played this one o'clock gig in the past. It's a, it's a civic concert series, beautiful park. And um, I knew that it gets started slow. People bring a picnic lunch and they sure. kind of chill. And then, you know, if the vibe is right, they will dance the, the last half or the last quarter of the show. But given all this information in my mind, I knew that, you know, the band could probably use a collective breather. And so I put about five kind of like easy tempo, not easy to play, easy tempo songs. And we just started and created this kind of nice soft vibe to start as opposed to our usual like come out like of the barn game. Jam. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So like the first song we did was You Make Me So Very Happy by Blood, Sweat and Tears. Second song we did was Peg. Um, and we just put a couple of breathers in there. And everything about this gig was nice. I mean, the, the stage volume was perfect. The the vibe of letting those first couple of songs breathe and just let us ease our bodies and our minds into a gig after a night gig the night before. You know, it must be like, you know, being a ball player and you play a, a double header the night before, and then you have a, after, a day game the next day, you know, it, it, your body just has to acclimate. And so I purposely set up the set list to allow that. And I think a, it set a really nice mood in the park. I mean, it was great crowd and they were enjoying you know, just getting settled. I was going to say they, it, yeah, it wasn't like you were doing this for an eight o'clock set time. You were doing this for a right. one o'clock set time. So it wasn't just you that it worked for. It worked for the crowd too. And that's the key, right? If if you're yeah. tired and you're showing up for an eight o'clock gig, you probably can't come out of the gate with a bunch of softballs and expect to deliver the show that people want to see. But at one exactly. in the afternoon, yeah, you sure can. <laughs> yeah. But it, it brings to mind this concept about, you know, shared crisis brings people together. I mean, like I said, I know my body was kind of tired from the yeah. previous three days. And I'm guessing all of my other guys, you know, the drummer has to haul us stuff. The keyboard player has to haul us stuff. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, energy being expended. And I just got the sense that everybody enjoyed easing to this. And then once that vibe was set and everybody was truly nice and warm. Voices were warm. You know, the first couple of songs weren't the most challenging vocal songs. Yep. We enjoyed this gig so much. I mean, it was, it was just, it felt like we were ending a little chapter of a road trip on the same page. The playing was really sublimely great. And then, you know, like I said, the last third of the gig, we kicked it up quite a bit and, and we took it home and it just seemed to work for everybody. Just that, that clever, smart, design of the set list to, to yeah. build mood and then, you know, deliver the thing that people remember you by at the end. It just worked in spades for this situation, the yeah. setting, you know, this, this history of having played the last couple of days. That's cool. So anyway, that, that was it. It's like, you know, sometimes I, and I would imagine most of us after the third gig, were like, Oh, one more, one right? More. Yeah, all I got to do out. is make it through one more. That's right. <laughs> exactly. But it yeah. actually turned out that it, and everybody was like, in a really high mood, you know, smiling, happy. That was really fun. And so sometimes, you know, as a leader, you got to anticipate that stuff and, you know, figure out how to nurture your band through a gig. And as a band member, you got to give yourself up to it and just be like, all right, you know, we're into this. And I you know again, everybody wants to give their all for every gig. That's I'm not saying that that, that was that it. No, no. Your body, 
Yeah, I, 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 yes, Th- that whole flow, managing the flow on stage generally needs to be, you know, we've talked about this before. It generally needs to be one person's job, even if your band is, you know, democratic or you share, you know, different people take different leadership roles in different ways on stage. One person needs to take the reins for that, to, for managing the flow and the set list and all of that. And a big part of it is understanding the tools that you have to work with, AKA the musicians that you are sharing the stage with. Right. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I've had nights where, and, and that person really needs to be the type of person that not only can put some thought into it in advance, but also able to sort of perceive what's going on and react. And if necessary, adjust based on that. I've had, you know, gigs where, You know, it's like, okay, well, I paste it all out. Yep, this sounds good on paper on Friday afternoon. Now it's Saturday night. Things are very different. We're halfway into the set. That guy's had too much to drink. He can't sing anymore. You know, I need to adjust or the crowd is going nuts. We can't play a breather at this point. Otherwise, we're going to lose them. Like just that that, you know, situational awareness. And, And to your point, whoever's doing that, the rest of the band needs to just sort of uh, you know, give themselves over to it and you can discuss, you know, game time decisions later, but in the middle of the game, just go with it. And, yep. you know, feedback later is great. Feedback in the middle of it derails. things. Not so good. Yeah. Not so good. I, the, yeah. the side benefit to this was, you know, especially when you're a bar band, you know, a bar band, yeah. a bar is a fight. You are fighting, you know, volumes and venues and, and a certain level of chatter when you have one of those gigs where, and again, not, the sound was awesome on well, you're, Sunday. Yeah, you're outside, right? So this outside, outdoor sound is almost always, you know, remarkably better than indoor sound. Almost always. And, but we, you could actually feel, feel the front of house, right? So, yep. you know, you got a sense that you were projecting really well, nice. which let all of us relax. And like I said, a bar gig is hard to relax. You kind of, you just press through most bar gigs, right? Uh, agreed. S- sound is never ideal, right? It, it's, you know, the rooms are smaller the sounds bouncing all over the place. There's a din, there's clinks of glasses. I was going to say all the, sorts the, of the things. conversational din. And then you, like you said, the, 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 the noise that everyone else makes changes yeah. a bar gig dramatically. Yeah. It's crazy. So even yep. for a, you know, a high energy band, when you don't have to hit your drums as hard, you don't have to dig in on your vocals as hard. And you actually get that sense of what it feels to just be able to yeah, just get play. a comfortable volume and a comfortable vibe, just emote your music. It's really a magical gift. You, don't, you know, we don't all get those situations where you can do it. We don't get it when you don't get a good sound check and, you know, you got to hit the, hit the stage on the fly and you're waiting for stuff to click in. But when it's all in that Nirvana, you know, yeah. beautiful stage such a relaxed thing and it, you know it just energizes you tremendously so the fourth of four was a pretty magic day for us they're all good gigs but the fourth of four days in a row was pretty magic and you know we you learn a lot and you you are reminded more than you learn you know the stuff you are reminded of what good feels like and how good you can be as a band yep. when you can relax and just play so that was that was a pretty cool thing that's awesome Hey, one other thing we did that was kind of cool. I'm going to take a minute here first before we before we do that is uh, I want to take a minute and talk about our sponsor today, which is Banzoogle. People who have been listening for a while already know about Banzoogle. They've been a sponsor for a little while. Paul, you built the House Rockers site with them. And that's what they do. Right. It's built by musicians for musicians. Banzoogle is an all in one platform that makes it super easy to build the website that you need for your music, for your electronic press kit. And there are tens of thousands of musicians around the world using it from people you don't know to people you definitely know. And it's because Banzoogle offers all the features that you need. One of those features that they've recently launched is a new crowdfunding engine that lets you crowdfund your next project commission free. Yes, that's right. Commission free funds from all the pledges go directly into your account without delay and no percentage is taken off from the money that you've raised. So you get that plus their mailing list tools, the merch and download store to sell your music and merch. 
commission free right on your website and you can use a calendar to promote your shows and sell tickets did i mention that that's commission free yes of course it is plans start at just eight dollars and 29 cents a month which includes the hosting and your own free custom domain name so go to bandzoogle.com you'll start your 30-day free trial then be sure to use promo code gig gap that's Two, well, three G's, two of them are together. G-I-G-G-A-B. That gets you 15% off your first year of any subscription you choose. So that's Banzoogle.com, promo code GIGGAB, all one word together. You build your website, your electronic press kit, and all of that stuff today. Our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring this episode. Thank you, Ben Zugel. So Love true. it. And it's just another good example about this concept of being built by musicians for your music. They know what business they're in. They're in the business of providing a hosted platform and, you know, musician promotion tools, right? That's and it. And when it comes down to just, you know, obviously why would they want to get their hands into your crowdfunded money, right? That's not their business. No, they, right? you pay them to host your website there. I mean, that's exactly. like, that's what you do. And they, they get that. Oh, it's great. Yeah. So go it check it out. Banzoogle.com. And then remember gig gab is the promo code. I, you were talking about the flow and everything. And it, it reminded me this weekend I was, uh, we actually took the family and, and saw a uh, fish at Fenway park two nights, Friday night. No problem. Everything went great. Uh, the Fenway Park has a relatively early curfew. They've got a 1030 curfew there. So tickets said the show started at 630. We knew from experience that meant seven. And sure enough, they played from seven until about, you know, 1020 with a with a set break. Fish plays a two set show. All was good. Everything was great. But we all knew that Saturday was typical New England weather, meaning it was like hot AF during the day, like muggy 90 degrees and the rain comes in New England here to push that out. It's great. It You get like a couple of days of warm and it gets hotter and hotter. And then the rain comes, pushes all the humidity and heat out, drops it down, back down to about 70. Wash, rinse, repeat. That's what our summer looks like. Well, the timing of the rain wasn't so good because it was due to arrive right about five o'clock on Saturday. And it was going to thunderstorm really hard. So I was like, okay. So the band said, they sent out a thing. They're like, we're going to try and start the show right at 630. Because you never really know what the timing's going to be. And they're like, look, get into the venue early before the rain comes. Hopefully we can make this all work. So we did. We got to the venue at about six. It's pouring rain when we get into the venue. What we did not know was about 30 minutes later, they closed the doors to the venue and weren't letting any more people in because they couldn't let anyone out onto the field. The rules are such that if there's lightning, nobody gets to be exposed to the lightning, which is kind of nice. You know, it's good. So the band didn't start till 830 and at about maybe 730, they pushed something out. Fenway Park and Fish pushed, pushed something out on on. Uh, Twitter, I guess, and and said, hey, look, you know, here's the deal. The show's still going to go on. The rain is clearing. We can see from the, you know, the radar charts that this is going to work out. The band will not be taking a break tonight uh, in order to comply with the venue's curfew. So this is like 730. We still aren't allowed out onto the field to take our seats or anything. Not that we'd want to sit in them because, you know, they're soaking wet. But uh, we're all kind of wondering, like, how short is this show going to be? 1030 curfew. It's 730 now. You know, the earliest this thing, we didn't know that it was scheduled to start at 830 because they hadn't pushed that out yet. But I'm like, yeah, this doesn't. Uh, OK, well, whatever. You know, we'll go with it. So uh, we went. The show started uh, at right about 830, maybe 835. And they did. They played one set until 11 o'clock. Starting at 1015, everybody started getting confused because no one knew that the curfew had been pushed back an hour. So it was like, oh, they'd play a song at 1015. It's like, oh, this is probably the last one of the set. Maybe they'll squeeze in one for the encore and, you know, call it a night. And then it just kept going and going and going like, all right, you know what? Don't worry about it anymore. Just enjoy whatever happens is going to happen. And they played and then they took a, you know, four minute break or whatever and then played a two song encore. And all the reports that came out were based on this this rarity that fish had played a, uh, a you know a one set show something they've really never done before and a lot of the articles about it were saying you know it was a little bit shorter than than friday night but but it was still a good show and i was curious how much shorter it was mm -hmm. 
So I have uh, actually a listener, Gary, who takes care of me. He makes sure that the morning after every fish show, uh, he makes sure to find me some tapers uh, link or a link to some tapers version of the uh, of the shows if I want to download it. So I already had these shows. So I went into iTunes on my computer and I highlighted all the shows from uh, from from Saturday night or all the songs from Saturday night. So how much music did we get? And we got two hours and 42 minutes worth of music. It's like, okay, cool. And I looked at Friday night and we got two hours and 41 minutes of music on Friday. <laughs> and then I looked earlier in the week at different shows that, that, uh, that I had had the, the good fortune to get these links from Gary to download two hours, 39 minutes. I looked back spot checking over like the last, I don't know, 15 years checking different shows Somewhere between two hours, 37 minutes and two hours, 44 minutes are where the, the majority of the shows land. There are outliers. There are some three hour shows. There's a few that are like two thirty, but really not that short. So here's this band that hits the stage. They will tell you there's no set list and, and there isn't. There is a song list. They, they've, they've discussed how they find these things and it's quite fascinating and all that stuff. But they go on stage with an idea of about 30 or 40 different songs they might play that night. And then they kind of pick from there. Although the rule is once they hit the stage, everything is fair game. And if you know they wind up in the middle of a song that's not on the list, they play it. Uh, they walk on stage and don't know what the first song is going to be. Like this is a whole thing. However... Even though this band is rooted in spontaneity and that's what everyone comes to see, the amount of time that they spend on stage playing music is very much a regimented thing. I mean, these guys are running a, you know, a large business here in terms of, of the amount of cash and people that they employ and all that stuff. And, uh, and so it makes perfect sense. But I was really shocked to see like, it, like two hours and 43 minutes is this like average that really is like maybe detoured by three minutes on either side. And that's it. It's really crazy, like how they time it that much. And they play a completely different set list every night. And that's Trey that uh, is probably the timekeeper. He's managing the whole thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 He says he doesn't bring a he says he he spends the whole day. He, they have this process where he'll come up with a list of songs that he wants to play. It's maybe 75 songs or whatever songs that could be on the list. And then they sort of pass that around and everybody sort of whittles it down throughout the day. And it gets to, like I said, 30 or 40 or whatever it is. And he says, then he looks at the list and what he says is he throws it away and walks on stage and whatever he remembers is what, what goes on. Mm. Anyone that's been to a fish show knows that that's a lie because in front of him on the floor <laughs> is a list of those songs. And you can see him as they're like ending a tune. He's leaning down, looking at the list. And over time, he leans closer and closer because like many of us, uh, he's experienced that uh, over the past several years, you know, the sun has gotten dimmer and dimmer. So you need to get closer and closer to the paper to read it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wonder so, how much this I wonder how much the song count changes from show to show. Um, it, it, it changes because it, sometimes they'll play a 30 minute version of something and sometimes they'll play, you know, a few four minute songs. So like the song count is, is far more variable than the amount of minutes that they are on stage. Interesting. Yeah. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It just blew me away when I started doing that. I'm like, wait a minute. We, we had more music on Saturday than Friday. And I mean, you, you know, with a, a minute could be that the taper, you know, ended a little earlier one night than the other, but but in, generally speaking, like we're talking about, you know, a buffer of seconds here. So, yeah, yeah. it's really, really kind of blew me away that, oh, these guys, there's there's a method to the madness here for sure. There has to be, uh, you know, they they're working they're with venues, uh, you know, well, they're they, working with, mostly they're working with with curfews, right? Yes, they're working with curfews. Yeah. yeah. And, and what surprised me on both Friday and Saturday, knowing, well, Saturday in retrospect, Friday in the moment was that Friday they ended at like 1020 and I thought, well, I wonder why they didn't play all the way up to curfew. And then Wednesday, the same thing, or sorry, uh, Friday, Saturday, the same thing. They played, you know, they ended maybe 1115 or something. It was like because they played enough minutes of music that yeah. they they hit their self-defined quota. quota. <laughs> yeah, that's it. They hit their quota. It's just fascinating that they have a quota. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> just flew me away. Yep. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, switching gears a little bit, I just want to tell you about something kind of fun we did. You know, every gig, every gig, every single gig, you get people walking up 
saying it's my friend's birthday. Can you do a shout out to her? Have you ever done a gig where that doesn't happen? I'm sure I have, but it doesn't seem like I have. That's right. Oh, and actually, before I get into this story, I want to share. I did a a gig on on, uh, a solo gig on Friday night and a woman walked up in front of me and held up a napkin that said Elton John. And I was like, all right, I'll play some Elton John. Uh, I played Rocket Man and your song. Nice. Great song. No, no sign of the woman. She comes up as I'm packing up. She's going, <laughs> it actually kind of snarky. I really wanted Tiny Dancer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, from that behavior, we go over to uh, what happened at our gig Saturday night. Someone came up and said, hey, uh, we're all at a table. We, um, we're having a lot of good, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's so-and-so's birthday. Will you do a shout out? I was like, absolutely sure. And it struck me like, let's, let's take this up another level. I, it, we took our break uh, and I took all the guys over and we went to the table and we sang happy birthday to her, which just us approaching the table was this, you know, yeah. like, what's going on. Yeah. And then, you know, and then she, they really enjoyed it. And then we took a bunch of pictures with her and she was just on cloud nine. I would hasten to say we probably have a fan for life now. And, you know, certainly all the other people at the table with her. And it also, you know, you're always thinking about marketing it, it, the reverberation of what we were doing. Everybody turned around to watch and it was, you know, it just was a nice little moment different than the normal, Hey, you send in a shout out or let's, let's as a group. You know, I, I often find that asking the entire crowd to sing happy birthday to someone they don't know is a energy sucker. It's a disaster. Yeah. What you did was you kept the show going during the set break. That's b- brilliant, man. Yeah. I like it was, that. It was, but but it, it created such a nice, good, positive energy yeah. and you know, made, made a nice lady really happy, made her friends really happy. And just, uh, you know, I, I, I was thinking a lot about the state of live music and, you know, all the really great musicians I know that, you know, their heart and soul is into this every single day. You hear a lot that live music is on is on life support. And I I want to challenge that. I, I notice, this, you know, we're here in the middle of summer. There are people outdoor at music festivals, certainly the big music festivals, you know, sure. younger, younger music fans certainly eat up. Um, you know, every town around here has their civic concert series on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night. And, the, you know, the crowds are huge for these things. Art and wine festivals that have a music stage, they get great attendance. Why is music on life support? I mean, I, I, I challenge that that assumption right here and right now. And I'm thinking about this gig that I've told you about, you know, this coffee house that does one night a week. They, they do one night a week of open mic and they do a night a week of um, of uh, of program music, you know, hired music. Sure. And it, it, there's a great vibe and it's always full. And I wonder whether, you know, two things. One, the styles of music that are coming out now, how reproducible they are. A lot of the music that's being performed is you know, classic music, you know, it, whatever classic you want. Some of it is classic folk and country. Some of it is uh, classic rock, you know, whatever it is. So, sure. it, you know, the, the newer music that is highly dependent on synths and those types of things uh, or sounds or beats or, you know, just drums and, and rap, is that reproducible in digestible forms in different venues? But also, and I, again, I, I, I think about this one coffee house that I play, where the vibe at night, all of the chairs and tables are facing the performer. Um, it's about listening to the music. It's not background music set in the corner, which I think is the death of 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 live music. You know, when you do, when you when you relegate it so far that it's just taking the place of the elevator piped in music. Why do it? But but along the line, I how often do you hear when you're setting up? Uh, to do something like when you do the things with Amanda or, you know, when you do your unplugged stuff, when you hear someone say, Oh, they've got live music tonight. Like it still resonates that live music is a special thing. It adds value. People, right? yeah. People always come up and they're like, Oh, what time do you start? What do right, you play? Right, right. right. Yep. Absolutely. So, you know, there is a, a recognition that music makes something special. And I would say right now, venues should be figuring out how to make this more valuable to them. Again, to put it in the corner in a restaurant, a restaurant's in the business to sell food, you know, maybe that's not the right thing. Um, but this coffee shop that added it, they added late night hours. It's a coffee shop, so not, you know, too many coffee shops are open that late. And they've made it a music venue. And that's pretty awesome. I I think if you look at, at the, the innate value that art, you know, puts into people's hearts and minds and souls, 
figure out how that works. Because I would say, you know, even today, you know, uh, you know, Jason Mraz and, and Ed Sheeran and, you know, Taylor Swift, these are good basic songs that people hear on the radio. It, it, it elicits an emotion from them. They are reproducible in acoustic formats. They are reproducible in what I would call light acoustic uh, uh, format. So I've been doing this, this coffee shop solo acoustic for a long time. Just to mix it up, I invited uh, a couple guys to sit in and have a small kind of acoustic band. So, you know, Rush is going to do percussion or, or kind of a small beat kit. Um, you know, Simon's going to play guitar, uh, his choice acoustic uh, or electric. Chris Breen's going to play, you know, some very simple piano and a guy in bass. It's a band, but we're playing uh, coffee house appropriate music. We're not going to try to blow out the back wall and play classic rock. Set. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. And, you know, it's very casual, but it's it's going to be, you know, the guys know people are there. They're going to be staring at you. You have to you have to perform this music. So I, I just was thinking about how enthusiastic you find people are. And, and I, again, I had a great weekend four great shows of people consuming music and then thinking about every town has got thousands of people coming to their parks to listen to music. Um, you know, maybe the premise of the nightclub as the main channel for distributing live music needs to be challenged. I mean, a nightclub does what it does. You know, they're there to sell booze. They're there, you know, for people to get out of the house and, you know, it's a watering hole. It's a, it's a looking for love type of place, but for music really is rarely the right thing for that scenario, but yet it's been jiggered in. Right. So, I, you know, totally. I guess if, yep. if you're looking for love, you ask somebody to dance and see if there's a you know connection, whatever the equation for that is. But in terms of, reminding the world about the value that putting music out there to, in, to, you know, make people think, make people feel, make people connect, you know, there, there, there's a lot of power in that. And I don't, I don't know necessarily that, you know, the style of music and, you know, we went through that one period where everything was manufactured for a long time and the music just wasn't very good. I, you know, pick, pick when you want to place that thing, you know, early two thousands, you know, whenever it might be. Right. But you know, the desire. And, and I even find like, you know, you can play Beatles stuff and 16 year old kids r respond to it. Oh, right. Of I mean, this movie yeah. that's out now yesterday. Right. So saw the movie. Did you see you know, it? Oh, yeah. It, it's it's so a, good. it is good. You know, it's not, it's not brain surgery. It's not, you know, solving the world's problems. It does remind you how absolutely freaking awesome those songs are. Well, that's right? the thing is that movie it, without giving away, I mean, I, I think the, the trailers sort of give away the story, but but without giving away too many details, it, the movie celebrates that which the Beatles mean to most to many people. I don't want to say the Beatles mean, Beatles mean something to everyone, but the Beatles do mean something to a lot of people. And it really celebrates that fact. I that, agree that I that's agree. like that's what the movie's about. But it's it's actually a good story. It's funny. I, you know, I went to we went to see it with the family last week. And I went in thinking, OK, is this going to be a guilty pleasure? Like, <laughs> like, what, what is this going to be? And I left thinking, I loved this movie. I, am I going to get chastised for loving this movie? And, uh, you know, I don't really usually care about those things, but I was just curious. Like, am I w which camp do I find myself in? And it turns out a lot of people I mean, some of the critics, you know, lambasted it or whatever, because that's what critics do. But people in general seem to really like it, even the diehard Beatle nuts. And I will tell you, the songs in this movie don't necessarily sound like the Beatles did them. Right. And and the story fits that very, very well. But um, but yeah, yeah, real I, I love that movie. I thought it was the, really the, well done. The first yeah. scene after after when he when he plays his first Beatles songs, you know, he, he, and I don't want to give too much of the movie away, but you know, the guy gets hurt and and then his guitar gets broken and his girlfriend gives him a guitar and he plays yesterday and you know i think everybody knows the premise is if the beatles never existed right and, and you know just the the stunned look at, the, the lyrics of yesterday you, i found They're you know spectacular oh, oh my god you know that and and the, the girl says that's the greatest song i've ever heard right yeah and <laughs> and and that moment <laughs> kind of sets the tone for yeah. really what that movie is about but the point being beatles music great music perfect music 
resonates still. You can test this over and over again. Yeah. There are so many Beatles songs that you can pull out that will connect with people in different ways. The very last scene of the movie, I'm not going to give it away, but he's playing music for a, a, a crowd of young children. Yes. And it's it's beautiful. I mean, it is it is exactly that, that point of connection to music. So my point to this whole rant is that that thing in human beings that reacts to art has not gone away. I, I think you have to, you know, be good at the art and you also have to have the right settings for the art. Well, that's and so, just it. You know, I spent the weekend seeing two concerts. You spend the weekend playing, you know, what, three or four gigs, four gigs. And one thing that is completely frowned upon at concerts is talking while the band is playing. In fact, at fish shows, I don't know if people call them this at other shows. I've never heard this term, but at fish shows, they call those people chompers because, you know, they're moving their mouths. And it's like, oh, I had this chomper behind me or whatever. And, <laughs> and and some people go so far as to, like, have cards printed up that they hand out to people like, look, you know, please don't talk while the band's playing. And uh, I mean, it's sort of a passive aggressive thing. But but it it like no one's going to to think that you are out of line if you politely ask someone to 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 stop talking. The person who's talking might think you're out of line, but it's usually because they're a little bit drunk. And they felt the need to tell some important story while the band was playing. But it's the wrong time and place for that. A bar, on the other hand, is where people go to sit with friends and tell stories over a drink. Yeah. So having a band in a bar is like there, there's counter purposes here. It, it, I, I'm with you on this, that bars are not the right place for bands. They just are. Uh, the usual. It, it's the, the usual the, it's place. It's like a habit where they got into. It's the status into. quo. You got it. Yep. Yep. So I, I would, I would bring this whole conversation around saying I, I want to encourage musicians be, be creative and look for cool places to to ply your craft. Um, uh, don't don't just accept for the status quo that you know. Well, that's a place that lets there be music. Get creative. Find barns. You know, figure out what the you know the legalities are. Find you know, look at a site and say this would be a cool place for music. Right, yeah. whatever it may be. Um, what was that crazy uh, movie? Um, Super was Superstar when Mark Wahlberg is a singer who gets tapped to join a famous band. Do you remember that movie? Uh, yeah, I, I think it was it Superstar. I know that um, uh, Mike Mativic from Steelheart did uh did all the singing for uh right. for that movie but yeah 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 yeah. i think it was I remember that in the beginning of the movie you know he's in a local cover band in the town he lives yep and they find this rock kind of star. warehousey type thing rock star. rock star and then they find this kind of warehousey thing and they bring in lights and they bring in stage and they you know produce their own shows and they kind of create the environment that they need that will best serve the music that they're doing that that I always thought that that was kind of cool. Maybe that's been in the back of my mind the whole time, but look for cool places here in Northern California. We've got gorgeous wineries with gorgeous venues uh, and more and more um, they're getting the message that, you know, people will come and instead of just coming to the tasting room for a half hour, they will come. They'll bring a picnic lunch. They'll buy two bottles of wine instead of just tasting yep. and spend three or four hours there um, and enjoy listening to music. If the music is good, good band leaders, good creative entrepreneurial musicians will develop a critical eye that says this could be a really cool place to share my music and, you know, find like you did it with the stone church, right? You yeah. said this yeah. the right vibe for families to come in. And uh, so just, you know, shift your view of the world. Don't just accept, you know, well, that's a bar and they have a stage. And so that's that's where we will play music. Get creative. And, and because I do think that there still is demand. There still is a thirst. There always will be a thirst for art. But there's a thirst for you know, th th that magical connection that music uniquely creates. Look for places where you can make that connection. And I think they'll be good. And I'll give you one more example. So we the gig we did Saturday night. Is uh, is uh, I've been talking about that we've been doing ticketed shows in, in a couple places. So we did a ticketed show that was twenty two dollars for wine club members of this particular winery, twenty five dollars if you're not a wine club member, and thirty dollars at the door. That's a pretty expensive it's ticket. A, that's a hefty especially, ticket, especially yeah. especially given that you can see my band for free in many places all around all summer long, um, yep. all summer long. And actually just a week ago, we did a, a show that was $5 in advance, $10 at the door at a place that's about 
10 minutes away, 15 minutes away. The point of this is, is that um, this place where we're charging this tick, this ticket price creates a great vibe. It's, you know, for those people who don't want to go to bars and nightclubs, but want to go to a safe place, go dancing. It's absolutely worth every penny for them to go to this place that they trust. That is beautiful. I mean, the vibe makes you feel a certain way. The stage is huge. The band looks like, you know, a touring rock band, not just a cover band in the corner of a, of a, of a small bar. I mean, everything about this supports the value of the ticket, you know, for those who bought it and we sold 200 tickets. So that's pretty darn good. Well, that, that's just the thing, right? Is when you're being creative and, and thinking about these opportunities, you, you need to, you may see opportunity somewhere where the current management or owners or whatever don't. And sometimes they might be very open to hearing your idea. Other times they might not. I mean, the stone church you brought up as an example, but that truly I've seen it go both ways, right? We walked in there and said, okay, look, we've got a crazy idea. And the woman that was managing the place was this woman, Abby. She was, she really understood how to look beyond, you know, just the typical, I have a club that's going to live and die by my bookings sort of mm. scenario, right? She, she understood that you need to have events and things and music's a part of it. And sometimes music is the top billing and other times music is, is integrated into whatever the event is. And what we were doing was an event for families that was about music, but you know, it was more than just, there's a few bands playing. It's like, there's a, a, a method to the madness. And at the same club, I saw it switch when she left. It has since switched owners, but th this change happened before the ownership switch happened. Uh, this woman, Abby, left and uh, went off to do uh, big, bigger things with her life, uh, which made perfect sense because uh, she kind of has that that eye for things. And when she left and they kind of turned the booking over to a booking agent who's very traditional in, you know, in the way they do things, uh, it the, those events stopped working. And it was like, really? wow, like it took us a couple of events to realize, oh, it was, you know, this partnership between us and, and Abby, who was managing the place. You know, we saw we had the same vision. And so we were able to put these events together and really make them a success. But without that partnership on the other side of it, it, it just didn't work. It didn't matter that even we even had a proven formula. They had changed the way they were doing things. And so it just stopped working. And it, it, like I said, it took us a little while to sort of wrap our heads around like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah OK, that's fine. Let it go. Move on. And and the reason I share this is, it, you know, you may find this. You may see the perfect opportunity somewhere. Don't be blinded by that. You know, go talk to the person who you need to partner with on this and make sure that they are at least open to the the idea and hopefully more so, more than open on board with it and engaged with it because otherwise it's not going to work if they're you know like well uh you know 28 nights a month we do things this way but one night a month you know we do it this way and another night we have an open mic it's like yeah you might that might not be the right person i mean it might be they might be looking to experiment but you know be be aware of that and be willing to say, OK, like this is the wrong place. It looked like the right place until I learned more. Now it's the wrong place. No problem. Move on. Great. You know, well, you and I, as as entrepreneurs and business people, you know, we have a certain way to think about the implications and, and you yeah. know, planning and you know all, all that type of stuff, you know understanding that your goal is a win-win for everybody, a win for you uh, without considering the win for the people you want to partner with is not a win. Right. But when done right and when the right questions are asked in the beginning, yep. this is a definitely rising tide lifts all boats. I mean, everybody feels good about a beautiful event Absolutely. that, that, you know, delivers the goods. Like I said, this, this coffee shop, you know, they now sell a lot of wine and coffee at night when it was before they didn't have, you know, much of a nighttime business and, um, and musicians get a place to express their art and yep. the proprietor gets to, you know, gets to say that they host this and they get the community pride and it, it, it just works on so many levels when approached in the right way. But, you know, not all, not all places will have a proprietor that is going to, is no. going to be open to the idea. Yeah, they, they need to see it as a non-zero sum game, right? I mean, that's the idea. It's like, like you said, everybody gets to win, including all the attendees. It's like, you, you know, it's it, there's this three-way thing, and it doesn't need to be that someone loses in order for someone to win. It everybody can win together. There's no, it like this is it's music. It's not some sporting event. Nope. There's nobody needs to lose. <laughs> so yeah.
Yeah, it's good. It's good. And I think that's the, uh, that's, I think that's the way it needs to go for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, wow. We've gone almost 50 minutes here. Look at that. We got, we've got a ton of other things left, but we're going to leave those until the next time. So Paul, are you still there? I know you had some. I'm here. Okay. Yeah, all right. I'm here. Okay. All right. I know there was some noise in the background there that you, you deftly avoided, which was great. So thank you for that. Um, here, in the, here in Los Gatos World Headquarters, I think the, the PG&E people have come to cut the trees and they didn't, they didn't give me any notice. So, of course so, not. Uh, of course yeah. not. Yeah, that's how it goes. Well, it's time. This is, to, this it's, is real life podcasting, folks. It's time to, to end the show anyway. So it's, it's all good. Uh, folks, if you have any thoughts about anything that we've shared or any gear that you want to tell us about or really anything, we love to hear from you feedback at giggabpodcast.com our goal is to incorporate your feedback into every single episode and in order for that to happen you make it happen and you've been making it happen which is awesome feedback at giggabpodcast.com paul what was the email address giggabpodcast wait it's feedback at gig podcast.com easy Call for you to say there, i did yeah. i know <laughs> feedback at giggabpodcast.com that's it that's all it takes folks thanks so much for hanging out with us thanks for listening thanks for sending in your feedback in advance we'll see you next time paul you got five gigs man i want you to remember one thing tell me dave always be performing i'm on it all right 